Uh, I hope that you are doing well uh, wherever you are in the world and what whatever time of the day you are experiencing what or night. Uh, so today we have another uh, SDMS. I see a lot of familiar faces. I don't think I have to, uh, you know, give a detailed introduction about the format. But for those of you who are new, uh, generally what happens is that we have a long form talk by a PI or a senior researcher for 30 minutes with 10 minutes of Q&A followed by a short form talk by a graduate student or postdoc for 15 minutes, followed by five minutes of Q&A. Today, however, uh, our uh, postdoc speaker had to cancel because of some health emergency in his family. And uh, we wish him uh, the best uh, with the situation uh, that he's uh, dealing with. And uh, we will have him later in our series. Uh, he, he was supposed to be Dr. Uh, uh, Rahul Misra from uh, MIT, uh, which whom I um, we unfortunately missed. So we uh, appreciate uh, and welcome any suggestions for our main speaker. Uh, if also we really, 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 really appreciate uh, the PIs to contact myself or Sapna if they have any. Uh, student or postdoc whom they, they think might have a good story to tell. Uh, and even if you are a graduate student or postdoc and uh, you want to nominate yourself, unlike what is uh, written on this slide, uh, don't be shy. Reach, reach out to myself and Sapna. Shoot out an email with your CV. And we will be happy to consider your self-nomination and work with you to find the best time uh, for you to be able to present to this uh, audience. Uh, towards the next of the, the rest of the year, we anticipate to have two events per month as we have had so far. So as I mentioned today, we have the pleasure of having one wonderful speaker, Professor Marjolein Dijkstra from Utrecht University. And uh, and uh, uh, Professor Dijkstra uh, uh, obtained his PhD uh, from Utrecht uh, from uh, is, was it Utrecht University University of Amsterdam under the uh, supervision of the legendary Dan Frankel. Then he got two Marie Curie uh, fellowships, which is for those of you who know, it's a very prestigious fellowship in Europe, and. Uh, it's very difficult to get it once and uh, Marilyn got it twice. And after that, she was uh, working as a researcher at Shell uh, before starting her own group at Utrecht. And uh, uh, one of the main focuses of her group is to study self-assembly. Uh, and I started reading Marilyn's paper as a graduate student and I was always very impressed by the depth of breadth of the work, right? I remember this one paper that had like, I remember like a hundred page SI with a lot of like detailed free energy calculations. And it's it's such a pleasure. And I always enjoy hearing talks given by Marilyn. And uh, I really look forward to hearing what she will be uh, telling us today about machine learning and inverse design of uh, uh, soft uh, materials. Uh, so because we don't have any uh, uh, other speaker today, uh, uh, I've instructed uh, Marjolin to go above time, maybe by, uh, uh, I don't know, 10 minutes. Uh, and I think everybody in this audience will appreciate that. So without further ado, I will stop. And I will give the floor to Marilyn to talk to us about machine learning and inverse design of solved materials. So I have to share again or what? I have to see. Yeah, what... you'll have to share again. Is it yeah. visible? I see many things on my screen now. Yeah, 
Now we see the screen we well. See, a little yes. bit at the bottom is a little yeah. cool for me, but I think it's good overall. So thank you very much for a great introduction. Uh, yeah, it's a great honor for me to be here and to, to get the opportunity to tell you more about our work that we did in the Subcondens Matter Group at Utrecht University in the Dubai Institute for Nanomaterial Science. And indeed, uh, the motto of our institute is Nanomaterials for Sustainability. And we use a bottom-up approach. Uh, that means we use the self-assembly of colloidal particles and nanoparticles to make nanostructured materials. Uh, and this idea is not new at all. It was actually introduced already by uh, Richard Feynman, who gave a wonderful talk at the American Physical Society meeting at Caltech in 1959, which was entitled, There is Plenty of Room at the Bottom. And in this lecture, he actually invited the whole physics community to enter a completely new field in physics, uh, in which we do not use the materials that we find in nature, like stones or wood or whatever, but we start to create new materials by just placing the atoms the way we want. And this inspired many, many res researchers. Uh, it opened also all kinds of discussions. Do we need a big machine to do this, or do we need a very small machine that can pick up atoms? It also opened discussions on how dense can we store information in materials. But it took about 30 years before IBM came with the so-called scanning tunneling microscope, where they indeed could pick up atoms and place it the way we want. And just to illustrate that as a proof of principle, they wrote an IBM logo using 35 xenon atoms on a nickel surface. And it took actually another 25 years before they came up with a tiny smoothie effort just to show that you uh, really can um, transfer information using materials. Uh, and this uh, movie was entitled A Boy and His Atom. And both these uh, achievements were really revolutionary. It was really groundbreaking. But this is, of course, not the way to make uh, new materials in bulk quantities. And so what would be a much better idea is to start with the periodic table. Uh, select your or pick your favorite element or a set of elements, make a compound out of it, and then make a another particle of these selected elements that you uh, take from the periodic table. And then if you make small crystallites or small nanoparticles of these uh, elements, you can basically disperse them in the solvent and then exploit the brown emotion uh, to use self assemble Assembly and then uh, make super lattices or crystalline structures out of these nanocrystals. And so this is an extremely cheap way to make nanostructured materials. And here is an example. These are uh, a few hundred nanometer uh, particles, silica particles that are dispersed in an in solvent. And one can clearly see using these confocal microscope images uh, that the particles are moving. There's, um, eternal motion of all these particles there, you uh, make, making this jittery motion that uh, is, uh, goes on forever. And you can see that if the uh, density of these colloidal particles is extremely low, they just move around in random directions. But if you concentrate the system by, for instance, evaporating the solvent, uh, so you go to higher colloid densities, uh, the particles spontaneously organize themselves on a three-dimensional lattice. And this is an extremely cheap way to make nanostructured materials. And so the colloidal particles really act themselves as big atoms. So, and this is also why uh, over the past decades, huge efforts have been made in making all kinds of particles. Uh, one can change them in shape, but also in size. One can make them from different materials, semiconductor particles, metallic particles, plastic particles, glassy particles, and so on. And one can even uh, tune the interactions of all these particles. So one can go from hard interactions, excluded volume-like interactions, towards depletion attractions, uh, charge, soft repulsive interactions, dipolar interactions, 
and one can even make these particles patchy in such a way that one can program the self the same way in the surface patterns of these particles. And so this uh, explosion of colloidal building blocks has also been accompanied with a, a boom of simulation studies. There's great work by the Torpedo group, the Glotzer group, also the uh, our group, Escobedo's group. Uh, they all studied the self-assembly of all these particles, different particle shapes. One can also coat the surfs with forms of surfactants. Perhaps I can find an, a pointer. Um, I actually don't know where it should be. Um, can you see my mouse? Yeah, we can see it. Yes. Uh, so we can also uh, change the surface and, and coat them with surfactants, polymers, or DNA. Um, and so one can also change the interactions by just uh, using these uh, uh, surface functionalizations. Uh, one can also play with the interactions of the particles. For instance, one can look at oppositely charged particles, positively charged big particles together with negatively charged small particles, and that gives us a whole slew of different ionic colloidal crystals. And this is done for big uh, colloids, but one can also do that for nanoparticle systems. So the idea is very simple. So we really like to exploit this this vast array of colloidal building blocks and use self-assembly to uh, put the particles uh, in the way we actually want. So we really want to place the insulating parts, the conducting parts, or the semiconductor particles really at the position that we really want. And this immediately comes up with a problem because there's really a combinatorial explosion of possible structures that you can make possible molecules, possible materials, elements, and so on. And so therefore, it would be very nice if you have a very fast way to uh, sample all these large uh, parameter spaces, uh, and machine learning can really help us to, to accelerate the materials discovery and design using, for instance, coarse grained models, uh, using, for instance, machine learning potentials, forces, or even functional. Uh, which enables us to perform high throughput simulation in such a way that we can make large databases. And from these large databases, we can hopefully derive design goals. And another strategy is to use the inverse design method, where we just start with the properties and the structure that we actually want, and then inverse design the underlying Hamiltonian that corresponds to uh, getting this structure and uh, the corresponding properties. So in this uh, talk, I'd like to show you how one can use machine learning to classify different phases, find code order grounds, and also detect local structures. I will apply that to the nucleation of a very exotic um, binary crystal uh, structure that can be observed in hot spheres. And I will also show you how one can use machine learning to cause grain system in such a way that you can really speed up the simulations of uh, complicated uh, color suspension. And then finally, I'd like to address how one can use inverse design to inverse design glass crystals, liquid crystals, and crystals. So the first question that we like to address was, how does a binary crystal nucleate? So if you want to better understand the self-assembly of these uh, nanoparticles or colloidal uh, particles, it is also good to understand how the new phase uh, forms from a disordered fluid phase. And so we really need to know how uh, such a new phase, a nucleus of the new phase starts to emerge in just a disordered fluid phase. And the crystal that always intrigued me was the AB13 cluster phase because it uh, consists, it's, it's stable in a binary hot sphere mixture. So just small balls and big balls uh, mixed together. And uh, if you are at the right conditions, it spontaneously forms in, uh, this very exotic AB13 crystal phase. And this crystal phase consists of a simple cubic of large spheres. This is already a very unusual lattice for uh, hard spheres because usually they form hexagonal uh, lattices. 
but in this case, it forms a simple cube of letters, but with an extremely large letter spacing in such a way that I call the hero process of third and small three fits in the center of the simple cube unit cell. And moreover, these icosahedral clusters are rotated by 90 degrees with respect to the neighboring icosahedral clusters. Uh, and these icosahedral clusters are made of 30 small spheres. So somehow the system, uh, if you mix big spheres and small spheres together, they know that the, that the small spheres have to make these uh, icosahedral clusters, and then the big spheres are uh, organized around this. And the total unit cell consists of eight of these icosahedral clusters, and at the corner there are all these big spheres. So they contain 112 particles in the unit cell. And they are observed for big spheres, but also in the nanoparticle regime. So if you really want to understand how such a crystal can form from just mixing big spheres and small spheres together, we have to go back to nucleation. Nucleation is that due to thermal fluctuation, small nuclei of the stable phase already appear and disappear in the disordered fluid phase in this case, until the crystal nucleus is, uh, exceeds the critical nucleus size, and then this cluster will grow out and to in turn it spans the whole system. And so here I already cheated a little bit because I um, plotted the, the solid light particles already in brown and with their actual size, and their fluid light particles I plotted 10 times smaller and in blue. So I really needed here in order to do that, a good order parameter that can uh, tell you on a single particle left whether a particle is, has a fluid-like environment or whether a particle has a solid-like environment. And this is actually very tricky to do because uh, if you really want to do that on a single particle basis, and you plot, for instance, the mm, uh, typical particle in a face center cube or an hexagonal closed bed or a body center cube crystal phase, you immediately see that the environments are very similar to each other. So there's this six fold ring around the central particle. Uh, there's, in the case of the FCC and the HCP phase, there's a triangle set of particles at the bottom and at the top. And only in the FCC and HCP, this triangular set of particles at the top is uh, uh, oriented in uh, the opposite direction. While in the body center cube of crystal phase, this triangular set of particles is replaced by a square set of particles. So you need an extremely good order parameter that can distinguish these subtle differences in the environment. So for that, we use the so-called bond order parameters that was already introduced by Steiner, Nelson, and Goncetti. Uh, we first have to define the local environment, which is just that uh, we have to define the neighbors of a central particle. Uh, you can, the simplest way is to use this uh, radio distance. So all the particles within a, a certain radio distance are called neighbors, and there are uh, many more algorithms to do this. And so these neighbors, you then uh, expand them in a set of spherical harmonics. Uh, you can take the cubic or the uh, quadratic variant of it and then sum over all the m values to make it rotational invariant. And so you can calculate all these QL values uh, from yeah, 1 all the way up to 24 or 12. And they basically measure the symmetry of the particle uh, with their local environment. So often Q4 and Q6 is used for uh, crystal structures because of the four-fold and the six-fold symmetry of crystals, of most crystals. However, if we do that for the AB13 crystal structure, then we immediately see that all the, uh, and here I did it for typical configurations of the AB13 crystal and the fluid phase. So every uh, point is just uh, the values for a certain particle in that configuration. And we see clearly that these uh, clouds basically overlap each other. And so it's impossible uh, to use the Q4 and Q6 point on the ground to distinguish whether it's an AB13 crystal uh, structure or a fluid stru uh, crystal structure. If you plot, for instance, the uh, radio distribution function, so the small, small, the large, small, and the large, large configuration, of a fluid and an AB13 cross structure, we immediately see that the 
uh, structural coronation in the, of the small parts are very similar for the uh, fluid in the AB13 cluster structure. Uh, and we see for the large mouth coronation that uh, indeed the distance where uh, the large particles uh, are in the crystal phase is really at an extreme large distance. So this is really uh, at a very large distance to make room for these icosahedral clusters. And this makes it complicated to define the neighbors of the uh, large particles in the uh, system. And so the question that we ask ourselves, can we solve these uh, uh, complications by using a neural network? So what we did, we calculated all these bond order parameters, the quadratic and the uh, cubic uh, ones. Uh, we also separated the different species. And in total, we had 36 uh, basically local descriptors for every particle. And by just training a neural network with configuration that we already know there from the AB13 crystal structure, the fluid in the FCC phase, we were able to train the neural network in such a way that it can uh, identify these different uh, uh, structures. So the, there are four output nodes that gives us the probability that it belongs to a large particle of the AB13 crystal phase, a small particle of the AB13 crystal phase, a fluid particle or an FCC particle. And so this neural network we can then use if it is trained to unseen data. And so we can also use it to identify and uh, understand better the nucleation of this AB13 crystal phase. So this is shown here. We can uh, refer to Morphe of, of such a nucleation trajectory. And we can really see that it starts with an icosahedral crystal of small, uh, the third and small part, but then big spheres are attached to that nucleus. Then more icosahedral clusters are attached to that. And if we then plot the number of big spheres in icosahedral clusters that are attached to that nucleus, we see that it is really a co-assembly of large spheres and icosahedral clusters of small spheres, and that really proceeds via uh, classical nucleation theory. So we can also use machine learning to coarse grain systems. Um, this is really inspired by the work of Baylor and Parinello, where they show that uh, one can do either electronic structure calculation or initial calculation. This, is, this goes with a very high accuracy, but it's extremely computational expensive. If we use uh, classical force fields, then the accuracy is much lower, but it is uh, much faster. If we use machine learning potential that are trained on electronic structure data, we can just uh, achieve a accuracy that is similar to the initial data, but with a speed uh, that is really comparable to the force field uh, calculation. And so to um, basically uh, fit the potential energy functions, they introduced uh, so-called symmetry functions that really describe the local environment of all the atoms. And so here we actually did uh, the same for so-called column polymer mixture. Often if you uh, do uh, self-assembly experiments with colloidal particles and you want to tune the interactions of the colloidal particles, you can either add salt to the suspension to change the interaction, or you can also uh, add non-adsorbent polymer to induce basically attractive interactions between the colloids. So in this case, uh, we have two colloidal particles. Uh, one can easily draw the regime where the center of mass of this polymer core cannot come. Uh, so this is basically the dashed circles uh, here. But if the colloidal particles come close to each other, these so-called depletion zones overlap with each other in such a way that there's more room for the polymer cores, more room for the polymer cores means more entropy. And so there's basically an effective attractive interaction between the colloids, uh, which increases the uh, entropy of the polymer. And so the range of this interaction is set by the size of the polymers and the depth uh, and the, the attraction well is determined by the concentration of the polymer. And so a very simple model that was introduced by Alginus Frey is uh, 
is called the as Asakura Osawa model. And uh, in this model, the colloid parts are treated as heart spheres. The colloid polymer interaction is also treated as a heart sphere like potential, and the polymer polymer interaction is treated as a uh, uh, ideal pairs. So the polymer polymer interactions are basically set to zero because the polymer cores can overlap with each other. And for this very simple system, uh, yeah, the total Hamiltonian of this binary image consists of sum of interactions term. So the colloid, colloid, colloid polymer and the polymer polymer interactions term. Uh, one can write down the partition function. It is convenient to treat the colloid particles in a canonical ensemble while uh, you treat the polymer uh, in the grand canonical ensemble. So the uh, partition function is a sum of, uh, of the number of polymers. And then the trace of the coordinates of the colloids, a trace of the coordinates of the polymers, and then weighted with the corresponding Boltzmann weights. And if you then trace out all the degrees of freedom of the polymers, uh, so that's basically this yellow piece, you end up with just a trace only on the colloid uh, degrees of freedom with a uh, Boltzmann weight that corresponds to an effective Hamilton. And so this effective Hamilton consists of the bare interactions between the colloid particles with heart sphere like potential plus an omega. And this omega is basically the grand potential of the polymers in the external field of the polymer uh, of the of a fixed configuration of the colloids. And so what I've done is basically I've mapped a binary mixture of uh, colloids and polymers onto an effective one component system, so a colloids only system, where the colloid particles now interact with a many body effective interactions uh, that depends on all the coordinates of the colloids. And this is an extremely complicated function because it depends on all the colo uh, colloid coordinates, but with machine learning, we can just perform simulations of the fine plane system, measure all this uh, effective many body interaction, and then use machine to fit basically this complicated high dimensional function. And so that is actually what we did. Uh, here we uh, perform simulations using these machine learning potentials, uh, and we compare the radio distribution with previous work where the full binary mixture was simulated. And so what we find is that the machine learning potentials really speeds up the calculus with two up to four orders of magnitude, and the uh, structure is really well captured by these machine learning potentials. So this is for a size ratio of one, where the uh, colloidal particles are as big as a polymer coils. Um, uh, we can also uh, and in this case, the uh, many body interactions are really pronounced. So because these machine learning potentials, we can assume them to be state independent. Uh, this is very nice because we can then also perform direct coexistence simulations in an elongated box. So here we find phase separation between colloidal gas and a colloidal liquid phase. Uh, in the colloidal liquid phase, it is dense in colloids. We can measure the density in the colloidal gas phase. It is very dilute in colloids, and we can also measure the density there. And then uh, plot all the binaural points as a function of the polymer concentration along the y-axis and the colloid packing fraction along the x-axis. And we can again compare that with previous work, and we find that the gas liquid binaurals are really well captured by these machine learning potentials with respect to the uh, full binary calculations. And so uh, this is for different size ratio. If we go from left to right, the many body uh, interactions become more pronounced because the uh, polymer cores become bigger in that case. So at the moment, we are also extending this to charge colloids, where we integrate out all the core and count lines. They are extremely time consuming to simulate. Uh, we can just machine learn also the effective interactions between charged colloids. We also apply it to Dickens stabilized nanoparticles, where the uh, particles are stabilized by Dickens on their surfaces. Also, this is extremely time consuming to, uh, to simulate all the time. But uh, in also here, we can 
uh, basically machine learning, the effect, effective many body forces, which we uh, calculate from molecular dynamic simulations. And we also are extending it to anisotropic particles and surface patterned particles. So that brings me to the last part of my talk, the inverse design. So the uh, standard approach instead of uh, mechanics is that you start with a certain particle shape, a certain particle interaction, and then a thermodynamic state points and so the pressure or the temperature. You then perform either simulations or experiments. You determine what structure comes out, and from the structure you can derive the properties for the structure. But this is an extremely time-consuming approach, and if your experimental colleagues uh, come to you in the next day and they tell you they have changed the synthesis uh, of the colloidal particles, so the shape has been changed, uh, this is really uh, extremely time consuming and would much, uh, be much nicer if we can turn this logic around. Uh, where we start with a sort of property that we actually like. Uh, we can then derive the structure that leads to those properties, and then hopefully we can uh, this inverse design the shape, the interaction, and the thermodynamic statement that can uh, lead to the structure. And in order to design such an uh, inverse design and certain target structure, we need an inverse design method, and that basically uh, consists of three ingredients. So first of all, we need a model with three design plans that can be optimized. Then we need a scheme to update this design plans. And then we need an order plan that can tell you uh, whether or not you are close to the target circuit and whether it can uh, distinguish the target space from competing phases. And so this order plan can then also be used in a, as a fitness function for, for instance, an evolution strategy. So we chose a system uh, which is uh, actually a classic crystal. Classic crystal is actually uh, also called nature's impossible phase. It lacks translation symmetry, so there is no repeated unit. Uh, so if you are, uh, it, it's not like a crystal where if you know the uh, unit cell and you are sitting on top of an atom, you know exactly where all the other atoms are. But if you take a diffraction pattern of such a quasi crystal, uh, it shows very sharp red peaks, but with a rotational symmetry that is forbidden for crystals. So there are many papers in the literature where are the atoms for class, quasi crystals, uh, structures of quasi crystals, where are the atoms, where are the atoms in quasi crystals, how are the atoms arranged. And so it would be very nice if we can inverse design the class first and we know exactly where all the atoms are. So the system that we took is a very simple model of ligand stabilized number particles. It consists of a hard core with a diameter of sigma, uh, and then a square shoulder with a range of delta. So the three design parameters that we have is the shoulder width, the temperature, and the pressure, or the density. And because this interaction potential has two competing link scales, it gives rise to class crystal and world. And so for this very simple system, we've mapped out the phase diagrams already many years ago in a temperature density plane. So this is a two-dimensional system. Uh, there's a low uh, density hexagonal phase. There's also a high density hexagonal phase. There's a square lattice. And then in between the square lattice and the hexagonal phase, there's a tiny, tiny density regime where there's a 12-fold Crystal. And so it will be really a challenge to find this uh, extremely small density regime where the classic crystal is stable. So we can also change the shoulder width. If we change the shoulder width, uh, we can stabilize an 18 fold, a 12 fold, and a 10 fold class crystal. So the scheme to update the design parameter, we use the covariance matrix adaptation evolution strategy. This means that we used uh, uh, basically a multivariate Gaussian distribution. The dimension of this Gaussian distribution is set by the number of uh, parameters that we want to choose. So if we want to tune the temperature and the pressure, it is a bivariate Gaussian distribution. And from this bivariate Gaussian distribution, 
we draw um, yeah, for instance, n uh, samples of temperatures of pressures. And for these n uh, combinations of temperatures and pressures, we then perform simulations, and then you evaluate uh, the performances of these n combinations in terms of uh, fitness functions. And so in, uh, you then uh, determine the fitness function, and you net the Gaussian distribution involved into the direction of where the uh, fittest uh, samples were found. So in order uh, to determine whether you are close to the target phase, we use a convolutional neural network that can classify the phases uh, according to the diffraction patterns. So I already told you that in order to recognize the class grids, you can look at the diffraction pattern. It has a rotational symmetry that is forbidden for uh, a crystal phase. And so we first uh, performed uh, Monte Carlo simulation for all the phases that are present in the system, a fluid, a square, a hexagonal, and the three different quasi crystals. We then save 10,000 independent configurations. We calculate the uh, diffraction patterns, uh, and we then train a convolutional neural network to recognize the different phases according to the diffraction patterns. And so we have six output nodes that tells us what the probability is that it belongs to one of these phases. And this probability is very nice because you can immediately use it as a fitness function. So uh, we start from this, uh, and this is the phase diagram in a pressure temperature plane. We start, for instance, with our Gaussian distribution in the fluid phase. Uh, we then draw n samples from this Gaussian distribution, so n combinations of pressure and temperature. We then perform simulations for these n uh, pressure temperature combinations. And then we calculate the diffraction pattern and we use the convolutional neural network to tell us what the probability is that it belongs to a quasicrus. And then we move the Gaussian distribution in a way that it uh, goes to the higher probability that it belongs to the classicals. So at first, the fitness is extremely low, 10 to the minus 6. So it's very hard to, uh, to know in which, in which direction it should evolve. But the, new, uh, the evolution strategy still knows that it has to go to a higher pressures to increase the probability to find the classicals. And within 10 generations, it indeed finds the uh, quasi crystal regime, uh, and the fitness function is then has a value of almost one. We can also use another output node of the convolutional neural network, uh, for just uh, that of the hexagonal crystal phase. And also in that case, if we start in the fluid phase, within a few generations, it is able to find the hexagonal phase. We can also uh, use the shoulder width as a design parameter. Uh, and also in this case, it's just able to find the 12, the 10, and the 18 volt class crystal. We then investigated with whether we can also transfer it to other model systems. Uh, for instance, a system that where the particles interact with a softened core shoulder potential. Uh, and also in this case, if we uh, want to inverse design a 12 volt class crystal, it is able to find this 12 volt class crystal. Uh, and this is just the phase diagram from literature uh, where we really confirm that there is a 12 volt class crystal. We can also ask it to find new class crystal in this case uh, that wasn't uh, investigated for this system before. And here we really discovered a new 10 volt class crystal for this system. And then finally, we also extended it to a three-dimensional system, uh, rope-like particles that also interact with a soft core shoulder. And in this case, it was also able to find this 12-volt uh, class crystal. Uh, in this case, we had to use three-dimensional diffraction patterns, which are very complicated to, uh, yeah, to classify by human eye, but a neural network really doesn't care whether the dimension is bent from 2D to 3D, so it was able to recognize these 3D diffraction patterns. And uh, at the moment, we are looking also at the zero lights. Can we inverse design the interaction parameters 
uh, using the same approach that Vanilla Morin Nero uses, uh, can we inverse design the interaction potential? And we can basically take yeah, a zero light structure from the database and try to inverse design the interaction parameters such that it stabilizes this zero light structure. And this brings me actually to my conclusion. So we use machine learning to classify different phases to find uh, good order parameters, but also to uh, um, to detect local structures in force as a nucleation simulation. We can also use machine learning to cause grain systems. So I've illustrated that to a simple color polymer measure, but we can also machine learn the forces. Uh, for instance, in the case of liquid stabilized nanoparticles. And finally, we also developed inverse design techniques where we can really inverse design liquid crystals, uh, crystals, but also basic crystals. And so I also have to, uh, of course, acknowledge all the people that did the work. Gabriel Cody, Emmanuel Boatini did the uh, work on the inverse design of the basic crystal. Xiao Wang and Alberto are now uh, extending it to the zero night. And all the great work that was done on the machine learning potential and the machine learned uh, forces uh, was done by Gerardo Campos Fino Nobles, but also Susanna Juliana and Laura co supervised some of the students. And I'd like to thank you for your attention as well. Thanks a lot, uh, Marioline, for the wonderful talk. So let's give Marioline a round of applause. And since we don't have a second speaker, we have a lot of time for questions. So just raise your hand and, uh, you know, you can then unmute or ask your question. If you don't want to, you can write it in the chat and I can ask Marjolin on your behalf. So we have Michael. Hey, Marjolin, thank you for that great talk. Um, I have a quick question about the first part about the nucleation of that binary crystal. Um, do you have a sense of what the uh, the critical nucleus size was in that simulation, roughly? Does it is it comparable to the size of one of those icosahedral clusters, or is it much larger than that? Um, yeah, I, I I didn't put in the nucleation berries. Um, I I think it's about one hundred. It really depends on the supersaturation, of course. Uh, we did seeding simulations here, uh, and then usually where we can do the seeding simulations, uh, the critical nucleus is on the order of 100 particles, 100 or 200 particles. But that's sort of also set by the technique that we use. Thanks. So we have Ilya. Hi, Marjolaine. I, I have a question on, on actually the, the last part. Um, so you use machine learning essentially as your fitness function. And, and yeah. I'm wondering how, how good does a machine learning have to be for it to work? Say if, if the machine learning has a 90% a fidelity to identify correctly, is that sufficient or do you need 99% accuracy of your machine learning classification to be able to drive it to the correct phase? Yeah, it, it's, I think it really depends on the, on the problem and the system. So we are uh, looking now in, in too many different systems, also indeed the zero lights. Uh, there we change actually to, to another order parameter. Um, so it's, here it was convenient to use uh, diffraction patterns because you can recognize class crystals according to the diffraction patterns and there is not, I think, a good order parameter. Uh, but in fact, the, the order parameter, you need a reasonable good order parameter. So it's, it, it doesn't have to be machine learning or a convolutional network. Oh, yeah, I'm maybe more wondering, even if you have the perfect order parameter or the, the perfect diffraction pattern, there, there's always going to be, um, say, an intermediate case where you're close to, to a phase boundary. And, and so I'm, I'm wondering, on, on even given the perfect order parameter, your classification with a neural network will never be 100% accurate. 
So how much yeah. inaccuracy can you tolerate in, in the inverse design? Yeah, there I, I, I think the, this, at the moment, this is not a big issue for us. What, what are bigger issues for us is, is that often uh, the new phase doesn't form spontaneously. And so you really have to push it over the barriers. So you have to combine it with enhanced sampling techniques for which you also need already a, a good order parameter. Uh, but it, it's more that it's, in, in this case, I think we were lucky because it, it's really spontaneous it forms all these quasi crystals and phases the, that we want. In the case of the zero lights, we often have to really push it to go in that direction. So we are yeah, now combining it with really announced sampling techniques. And also there you need to go to other parameters to, to drive it to the right phase. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any questions yet, so I'll have I'll ask mine. <laughs> uh, I think you answered one of the questions that I wanted to ask, which was, you know, how do you actually how easy it is to form these phases when you change your parameter. And that could be challenging, right, for more complicated structures with large nucleation barriers. But I have two other questions. The first question is regarding these uh, uh, multi-body machine learning based potentials for essentially depletion forces. Uh, that is very neat. And I wonder, have you tried testing it for situations in which there is a theory, uh, right? There are theories to estimate these depletion forces and weed out the polymers or the smaller particles, let's say. And to what extent are these multi-body effects important in those systems for which we have a basic theory to compare with? And the second question that I have is related to hydrodynamic interactions. Uh, so have you tried using this approach in flows? And if so, how does it perform in comparison to standard methods based on solving like maybe Stoxian, doing Stoxian dynamic simulations that are very expensive? Uh, are they cheaper than those expensive fluid dynamics-based simulations or they're comparable? Or what are the advantages and disadvantages of that if you have tried it? Yeah, in, indeed, uh, to treat hydrodynamic interactions uh, in a similar fashion, it is really on my list of uh, to-do. Uh, mm -hmm. We didn't explore that yet. What I can say is, yeah, we used the colored polymer mixture because a lot is known for that. You can really calculate uh, all the, yeah, basically it's free volumes that you have to calculate in different uh, colored uh, configuration. And you can tune the range of the potential by just going from smaller colloids to bigger, or smaller polymers to bigger polymers. So you have a handle to really uh, change the range of the interaction potential, but also the, the effect of many body interactions. Um, the same holds actually for uh, Charles Colloids, where you can change the range of the interaction potential by just, yeah, changing the salt concentration. So that's one, why we are also interested in, in Charles Colloids. There, I think the complication at a certain moment starts that if the, um, the interaction becomes extremely long range, uh, can we still use the Baylor Paranello symmetry functions? So basically the Baylor Paranello uh, symmetry functions are two body and three body correlation that mm -hmm. it measures. So if higher body interactions become very important, uh, yeah, you basically map all these many body interactions onto a three body correlations. So I was actually already surprised for the color polymer mixtures that they still work because we can determine that for a size ratio of one, where the polymer colors are very big, that second body 
correlations are important. Uh, there are seven body interactions, uh, but by mapping them somehow on these three body uh, symmetry functions, it still works pretty well. Maybe I should uh, reframe my question differently. So if you are looking at the very simple case of uh, like large colloids and small particles, right? Uh, there are analytical expressions for the depletion force. So you can completely get rid of the small particles and simulate large colloids with that potential. Uh, and I wonder, uh, basically so my question was how accurate are those older efficient methods of simulating these systems and it looks like you're telling me that these multi-body effects at least in these polymeric systems are extremely important right so you will get the physics completely wrong if you don't take these multi-body effects into account right yeah, and so that depends really on the system. So here we went, we can go to small polymers where we know there's an exact analytical uh, effect of two body interactions. But if you make the polymer cores bigger, then three body uh, interactions see. come in, and then four, six, five, six, etc. So we did test it and uh, also for the lichen stabilized uh, colloids, you can yeah also calculate potential of mean forces and then compare it with what you get from the machine learning approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very neat work. Uh, so uh, I will ask a question that I received from Poen Lin, who wrote into the chat. Thanks for the wonderful talk. I wonder whether. The, the inverse design approach can be used in the system when the number of distinct structural phases are unknown, or it requires that several phases have to be identified in the first place to power up the convolutional neural network and obtain good fitness functions. Yeah, I think in principle we can, um, so now we, use the convolution neural network where we know uh, yeah, the number of phases that are present in that system. We can also have, for instance, an output node that tells us that there is a new phase, so that it doesn't belong to one of the, uh, the other phases. And then if we indeed find a new phase, we can retrain the convolution neural network to also incorporate that new phase. So it, it should also work for phases that we didn't think beforehand. Thank you. So I don't see any other questions. If there is any or anybody else who has questions, just raise your hand and unmute. Uh, but I don't see, oh, we have something in the chat. Oh no, okay. So, I guess then uh, we will end the uh, official part of uh, SDMS. Uh, thanks a lot for showing up and we look forward to seeing you three weeks from now. Uh, we will start stop recording now and you are all welcome to hang around and if you wanna chat with the speaker and you wanna catch up with your colleagues and friends. So otherwise we will see you uh, at, on April 21st.